Main brief that lived in the best parts of Oakland, but people here say in recent weeks they'd seen him back on these streets, sometimes looking down and out. Newton was minutes away from death when he was found at 5.30 this morning. He was face up on a sidewalk in West Oakland. Some in the area heard the shots that killed him. The ambulance people was here just trying to, you know, bring him back. But the man never didn't move. Officially, police say they don't know much about the killing. At present, there are no suspects or no motive for the shooting. But sources close to the investigation say Newton may well have been the victim of the kind of street violence that is common in this poor neighborhood. The sources say in the last 18 months, Newton had become an addict to crack cocaine and only last night was seen begging for crack and for money on a corner near where he was shot. But many in this neighborhood say Newton was killed by the police. They knew what he represented. What he represented to some on this block was a strong black man who would not be pushed around. What he did was made the people proud of themselves again. He made people feel good about themselves again. Not to be afraid of this and afraid of that for a while. Some of those who feel Newton helped them have been coming to the scene all day. Some to bring flowers, some to simply be here. There'll be a vigil to honor Newton this evening at 8 o'clock, and we'll have a report on the vigil tonight at 11. All right, Mike, thanks. Thank you, Mike. To those who lived through the turbulent 1960s, that decade of change, Newton was a revolutionary, a name that was respected. But for police all over this country, the name Huey Newton was hated and feared. New Center Force Belva Davis took a look back now at the two sides of a man who did help change the Bay Area. Huey Newton is best remembered for founding the Black Panther Party in the mid-60s during some of the country's most turbulent times. He's also remembered as a kid from Oakland who grew up fast. He came from the city's poorest area, West Oakland. And it was also here that he had his most publicized brush with the law. And here again in his old neighborhood where he died this morning. Okay. Ironically, Huey Percy Newton was named after a segregationist. Huey P. Long, the former governor from Louisiana, the state where Newton was born, the youngest of seven children. Just after Huey's birth, the family moved to Oakland. Newton faked his way through public school, graduating from Oakland Tech without ever learning to read. But the times were changing. The social protest movement attracted Newton. He became a self-taught man, an intellectual, who eventually got a college degree. He took what he learned to the streets, seeking change, but it wasn't until he met fellow discontent Bobby Seale at college and founded the Black Panther Party, their relationship drew national attention and the ire of law enforcement, impacting a whole generation. Why a panther? He would say, well, the nature of a panther is that uh, if you push it into a corner, it can't go left and it can't go right, it will come out of that corner to wipe out its aggressor, to stop its aggressor. I said, well, that's something like what black people are in. Newton was the Minister of Defense and sealed the chairman. Newton wrote the Panthers Manifesto calling for black defense groups to patrol neighborhoods and protect citizens from what he called police brutality. But Newton took the Panthers outside of the neighborhoods. They're heavily armed. Whether their weapons are loaded or not, nobody seems to know. In one of the most daring demonstrations ever conceived, Newton had the Panthers carry weapons to the state assembly, protesting a gun control bill they claimed was aimed directly at them. Six months later, Newton was in the news again, this time for an early morning shootout with an Oakland policeman who'd stopped Newton and a friend on a traffic check. The policeman died, Newton was wounded and charged with murder. College students and Panthers joined in protesting Newton's imprisonment. He became a cause celeb. A left-wing political party nominated him for Congress. Newton was convicted of voluntary manslaughter and served two years in prison before his case was overturned in appeal. Newton lived on the edge of violence. He spent much of his life fighting off other charges, including another for murder. He fled to Cuba for three years, finally returning to San Francisco in 1977 to stand trial. His attorney was Charles Gary. Great guy, great human being. He was a teacher. He foreran Martin Luther King and others. But prosecuting attorney Tom Orloff said Newton was to the end a common criminal. He had a very violent life and I don't think it's surprising that he met a violent death. Well, that some people have a, um, uh, a distorted view of me 
and it gives me very much trouble. It's, it adds to the sort of timid personality that I already have. It makes me uh, uncomfortable uh, because I know that I can't give them all of those things that their idol is supposed to. And uh, I don't want to appear to them a fake, but I would just like to tell them that, uh, that uh, you know, I'm just another regular human being. Many of the social problems that Huey Newton and the Black Panthers tried to address in the Bay Area years ago are still serious problems today. New Center 4's Austin Longscott has that part of the story. Revolution has come. Hold the face. It's time to take up the gun. Hold the face. The images of guns and the rhetoric so defiant of authority made up a lot of the popular Black Panther image. But it was substantive programs aimed at helping needy people in ways the government would not that brought in a lot of support. For eight years, Erica Huggins directed the Panthers Free Oakland Community School, trying to counter a particular set of problems. Substance abuse, prostitution, persistent poverty, early pregnancy, um, all of the things that still beset young people today. Most of the students who we saw we're going to head down one road. And so we were able to stick another sign point, this post there that said, no, go this way. The school became known nationwide. Huggins remembers the day Rosa Parks came to tell children how her refusal to sit at the back of the bus sparked the Montgomery bus boycott. The children were just in awe. As a matter of fact, three or four little girls, about eight and nine years old, ran. As soon as they saw her, they ran crying to the bathroom. And I followed them thinking that something had happened. And when I reached them there, they said, oh, Erica, we're crying because Rosa Parks is at our school. We never thought we'd get to see somebody from a book. The school sparked other programs. When we started working with young people, we recognized, oh, my goodness. Well, the parents also need services. So we started a free clothing program. And then we recognized that there were seniors in those families that needed help. And so we started a senior program. There was a free health clinic, help for people on welfare, and other programs. They attracted Jonina Abram, now an editor at Black Scholar magazine. As I began to hear about some of the programs, the breakfast programs, the health clinics, I began to really feel that this was the way the black people needed to be moving, and this was the kind of organization that I wanted to be part of. Abram, the last editor of the Black Panther newsletter, first worked in the Panthers' free breakfast program. It was to, frankly, to feed hungry children. But we also felt we wanted to bring to the attention of the society as a whole that there were many children, not only black, but other children of, of other colors, who went to school hungry and that the government should be doing more about this. Today's problems seem to have overtaken what the Panthers tried to do. Things are worse. And, and in my opinion, in fact, a lot of the demands that we had in our 10-point platform and program, as far as I'm concerned, they're still relevant today. Just the things that you mentioned, the, home, the number of homeless people, the unemployment, people that um, are hungry. Uh, I, the situation is no better. Did American society fail to learn something from the Panthers? Probably that is, the main thing would be that, this, that these problems are systemic, that they come from the system as a whole, and that they're not the kind of things that you can just throw a few Band-Aid solutions at over a short number of years and say, oh, we've done it. Belva and Austin are with us right now to add a little perspective to the life and times of Huey Newton. Let's start with Belva. Sometimes as reporters, and it is to our own failing, that we create stereotypes or polarize images like Huey Newton in the mind of the public. Did we ever come close to telling them who this man really was? I don't know if we told them, but he certainly let us know. He was a complex man. He was a dichotomy in beliefs. He, uh, I met him when he fell in love with a young woman who was a classical singer and decided that the marriage shouldn't happen because his reputation might harm her. She went off to Europe, and that's how they parted. So you have a guy who loved classical music, loved the classics, but on the other hand, it was an admitted revolutionary who wanted to change things by whatever means necessary. Did he, he understand said. what he was doing? I think he understood perfectly what he was doing. I think that uh, oftentimes he wished that someone else would be doing it rather than himself. He would really have liked to have enjoyed those things that he talked about, but on the other hand, he strongly felt pulled to do um, the kinds of things that he did. And then in the middle was this person associated with violence, and I think quite often rightly so. All right. As we turn to Austin now, what do you think, not just with black historians, but uh, historians in general, what do you think the legacy will be from such a complex man and so often full of contradictions? Well, I think his, his main legacy is going to be that he helped start an organization 
that tried to accelerate the pace of black progress and call attention to some of the social needs that are out there. He was very controversial, his organization was controversial, but it really inspired a lot of people to get politically active. And as you saw from some of the pieces, folks looked at what the Panthers were doing in terms of constructive social programs and got involved. Mm -hmm. And then we look at uh, the situation today, and very rightly so, many of those same social problems which they brought up and brought to people's attention at that time are the same, if not worse, today. That's Different true. shading on them. Is there going to be any reaction? Any reaction in the sense that people say, okay, here's a man who lived an ideal, who made some changes, what can we do now? There may in fact be some of that, and we'll see as the days roll ahead. I think it's possible now that he's dead, and this happens to people, of course, who die, to take a look at what he meant without bothering with the question of what is he now. And you've got to remember, he impacted not just the young people that he addressed, but uh, the mayor of Oakland today, appellate court judges, business people, city council members. These were all people who were affected by what Huey Newton did in Oakland. Many of them took the other path, and they were successful. He went one road, and we know what happened All right, to him. Austin, thank you. Thank you both. Another former Black Panther, Johnny Spain, won a new trial. It's in West Oakland neighborhood. It is a neighborhood known for its drug trade. Police say that Newton was shot three times in the head, and neighbors around here are both stunned and frightened. No one here would admit they saw the murder, but there are reports that two men had stopped Newton on the street pulled a gun, then fired point blank at him. Neighbors said they heard shots and then police sirens. It happened in front of Elnora Dillard's house. So I come and peeped out the door. Mm -hmm. And I, I mean, I opened my wooden door. But you never look when you hear the shots, why not? No, no, because I'm back in my bed. I don't look, they do that all the time you're out here. You hear shots out here all the time, honey. Police search through yards and cars for evidence. They say so far they have no clues and no motive. But sources say Newton was seen here last night, down and out, and begging for crack cocaine. Many people were driving by the murder scene today, still drawn by the Newton they remember. He was a whirlwind. He believed in change. Newton was a symbol of black power in the 1960s. In one of his more daring rallies, Panthers with Carbines marched on the California Assembly in 1967. They were protesting an arms control bill they claimed was directed at them. Newton had a long arrest record that included charges of murder, embezzlement, and drug, weapons, and parole violations. But despite his problems, his admirers say he spoke to poor blacks in a way no others could. Someone that a lot of people looked up to? Uh, someone damn near everybody down here looked up to. I know I did. I know most of the people I know did. All day, people have been dropping by this murder scene, dropping off flowers, saying that they're paying their last respects. One card left here said, to Huey for the early years. So far, no suspects have been found. Police say they are still investigating. This is Linda Yee reporting live from Oakland. Back to you, Emerald and Evan. Thank you, Linda. Thanks indeed, Linda. In an age of militants, the Black Panthers were that, but they were also more. They were admired by many, they were despised by others, and feared by a good many as well. And one of the moving forces behind the Panther movement was Huey Newton. He helped co-found the Panthers in Oakland in 1966, and he also helped give them their early image of angry young blacks with guns. In the years that followed, dozens were killed in shootouts with police, but the Panthers also had an altar image, one of serving breakfast to ghetto children and of being deeply involved in community issues. Those who were Panthers then have since gone in many directions, some to prison, some into the academic world, and still others have become public officials. Among the latter is Bobby Rush, a former flood of East Germany. Newton. In fact, investigators today were all over the West Oakland neighborhood where Newton was gunned down before dawn yesterday. They were talking to friends, questioning family and neighbors. And at least one witness told one police investigator that Newton was smoking crack and talking about people trying to kill him. And this, just minutes before he was murdered. New Center Force Mike O'Connor has the latest on the investigation. Police, still searching for witnesses, now say assassination is high on their list of possible motives for the killing. They say Newton had many political and personal enemies. Residents here say Newton had become a regular. Some saying if he was the target of a planned murder, this neighborhood would have been the place to find him. A woman who claims to be Newton's former girlfriend and who lives a block from where he died says he was with her from midnight until 2 a.m. the night before last and reportedly he spent from 4 a.m. until just before he died smoking crack in an apartment in this building. 
People who claim they were with Newton as he smoked crack in this apartment house say he seemed frightened, that he talked to being the target of killers, and that he was shot down only minutes after leaving. But police say there are other possible motives for Newton's death. Just an argument with uh, people who are on the street, uh, possibility of a, a drug deal gone bad, or an attempted robbery. Police investigation of the assassination theory is complicated by Newton's long history of political struggle and his criminal record. In 1967, he was charged with murder of a police officer. He was then cleared. In 1972, charged with assault, he pled guilty. In August 1974, charged with pistol whipping a tailor, later acquitted. A charge of killing a prostitute was dismissed. To 1985 charges of embezzlement, he pled no contest. To charges of gun possession, he was acquitted. In July of last year, he faced drug charges, and in February of this year, he was charged with cocaine possession. Still, it is for political organizing that he is being revered by some today. And if the murder was for political reasons, there may be many potential suspects. In Oakland, Mike O'Connor, New Center 4. The theory unconfirmed that Huey Newton was the target of a hitman, that his death was planned and precise, resurfaced today in discussions with Newton's wife and brother. As New Center 4's Austin Longscott reports, they say Newton was prepared for a sudden and violent death. Flanked by her son and her nephew, Huey Newton's wife, Frederica, said she had worried that he would die violently. I'm heartbroken that he did, but it was something that I always kind of prepared myself for, the, the inevitability of that happening. Newton's brother, Melvin, said he thinks the killing was no accident. Whoever did it uh, had planned it because uh, it uh, was done while he was in isolation and uh, it was done very efficiently. I don't think that someone just happened to do that. I think it was fun. Family members told the news conference they didn't know why Newton was on the streets of West Oakland at 5.30 in the morning. Uh, Huey was not interested in hanging out in Piedmont. Throughout history, we find that people like Huey surround themselves in the places where people are in the most need. If you remember, Jesus was surrounded by two thieves when he was put on the cross. His wife said despite money problems, his spirits were high, and he was working on a film for children. She called him a loving husband and a good father. The media had painted him to be such a horrible guy, and when I met him, he was just a sensitive, shy, loving kind of a man, and that's what initially drew me to him. Melvin Newton said his brother needs to be placed in the proper perspective. Uh, he was a man, and he had his weaknesses. If they will forgive Huey for his weaknesses, then we'll ask Huey in our prayers to forgive America for his genocide against the red man and for its enslavement of the black man and for its incarceration of the yellow man during World War II. The message was that like everyone, Huey Newton had problems, but he cared enough to reach out to help others. And that kind of reaching out needs to continue. In Oakland, Austin Longscott, News Center 4. There will be a public viewing of Newton's body Sunday. The funeral will be held Monday morning. Because Newton had no insurance and no money, a special fund has been set up to pay funeral expenses and create a program for young people to serve as a living memorial. If interested, you can contact San Juan Bank on Telegraph Avenue in Oakland. An Alameda County grand jury is expected in fact, he is one of the city's aldermen. Thanks very much for being with us. We appreciate it very much. Today we're hearing an awful lot of things being said about Huey Newton. He's being called everything from a savior to a gangster. How do you remember him? Well, first of all, I uh, think that Huey Newton uh, probably epitomized the struggle of young urban blacks uh, and their uh, fight for self-respect, their fight for respect from the uh, status quo, the power structure, their fight to, uh, to resolve the wretched conditions uh, that they find themselves living in. I think Huey Newton's uh, message to those young urban blacks was that uh, you have a, the power within yourself to change those conditions if you become organized and willing to make the type of commitments uh, necessary uh, in order to change those, uh, those conditions that you find yourself in. 
I remember Huey Newton as both a man of ideals and also a man of action, a person who uh, reached uh, theoretical heights, but yet and still he reached uh, down to the downtrodden uh, in this country and tried to mobilize and organize them into a, a disciplined political uh, vehicle uh, that certainly have brought about changes uh, uh, in this nation, certainly brought about changes here in the city of Chicago. Uh, Huey Newton uh, and, the, and the Black Panther Party, the legacy of Huey Newton and the Black Panther Party uh, is, is still being felt uh, throughout, this, throughout this country and indeed throughout the world. Uh, there are individuals who even today uh, are saying that the Panthers and, 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 and lauding the Panthers for their actions in the 60s. Huey P. Newton uh, is a man uh, who uh, this city uh, and members of the black community and the progressive community, uh, indeed the left uh, of the uh, uh, forces within this community, Huey Newton is a man whose who's death, le death leaves us with a, a gigantic void, and we're also very, very saddened by his untimely death. There are those who have said in recent years he seemed to have lost some of his vision and his energy. He was himself was lost. Have you kept in touch with him? Uh, I haven't talked with him in a number of years, and uh, uh, the only communications that I've had with individuals who might have ran into him uh, on the streets or uh, ran into him in different uh, locations and things like that. But I, I, myself, I have not talked to him in a, in, a, in a few years. All right. Bobby Rush, we appreciate it. Alderman, Chicago, we appreciate very much you taking time to reflect with us about Huey Newton. We should mention, of course, that we're going to have a lot more on the death of Huey Newton tonight on News Center 4 at 6, including a look at...